Yes, Lord, we bow our hearts, we bend our knees, Lord Jesus, we cast aside our idols, those things, oh God, that many times distract us, that take up our time, that are, not, are might be even okay things, but Lord Jesus, they distract, and Lord, we, we waste time. And Father, this new year of 2024, we want to use our time wisely, we want to use it effectively, we want to be your hands and your feet, Lord Jesus. Help us be a generation that seeks, Lord, you. O oh, God of Jacob, may we be that generation, this generation, before your great and glorious return, a generation that seeks you, Father, and, Lord, extends your kingdom to the world that so desperately needs to hear the gospel today. And Lord, as we look into your word this morning, I just pray you bless us, Lord, and, and God speak through me, and God anoint my lips to share only what you want me to share this morning. And, and God, may we have a heart to receive all that you have to say to us today. Amen. Amen. Well, this morning I want to uh, continue two-part series, uh, The New Year's Bees, part two for 2024, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 to, to uh, 21. And the New Year's Bees, uh, things that we need to do. And Ephesians chapter 5 gives a whole list of things that fit very well for this time of year things that we need to accomplish in our lives. We looked at a few last week. We looked at uh, th uh, four last week. We're going to look at three today and, and discuss how can I make 2024 a, a better year than, than perhaps I have in 2023. And we all said before that many times we say those three words, happy, what? Happy New Year. And, you know, people sometimes say that and they don't got a clue what they're saying. Many people are kind of inebriated when they say that kind of stuff, and Happy New Year, and it just, it's just a statement, it's just a blurred out comment, and if you'd sit them down and say, why do you plan on having a New Year, Happy New Year, they'll say, I have no idea, you know, how to, how to, how to have a Happy New Year, something that just, just naturally happened, you have to be strategically set in your mind, no matter what comes my way this year, it's going to be a happy new year because I'm going to make the most of every opportunity that God brings my way. No one ever says have a mediocre year or have a boring year or have the same year you had last year. It's always have a happy new year. And we need to look at that saying, God, is 2024, this year that's already started, is this year going to be a good year? And the Lord says to you, it's up to you. It's up to you. What are you going to do to make this year a happy new year, because it all stems from attitude. Attitude is a big aspect, a huge part of what comes to our lives when it comes to how we approach the next year. Two people, you have two people who have pretty well the same year. We talked about that in Sunday school this morning. You have people from the same family, and yet they have completely different perspectives, different attitudes. And one could, at the end of 24, could say, you know what? It was a challenging year, but it was a, it was a good year. And yet the person beside them could say, it was terrible. This thing happened and that happened. Oh, it was just, I, I never want to repeat that year again. And yes, some years are very challenging. I had a few challenges this past year myself. But the truth is, you can still look back on that year and say, God, this was, this was a good year. Jeremiah 29, 11, we know that God has plans for us. Our Teen Challenge guys know this verse, don't we? Jeremiah 20. I should get them to come on up here and quote it by memory, right? Roger? <laughs> I remember Roger in class sometimes. You always like, oh, I can't remember this. I was like, he did well, though. He did well, Roger. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Do we believe that or we don't? And as I said last Sunday, where was Israel when God gave them that promise? Were they sitting somewhere on the side of a, of a, of a, of a, of a bank with, a, with the ocean view and the breezes and palm trees and, you know, drinking a little drink with an, with an umbrella and saying, I know the plans are have for you, declares the Lord. No, they were in captivity. They were just put in Babylonian captivity. They were prisoners. They were ripped from their homes, from their country, from their family. They experienced death in their homes. Their possessions were completely wiped out. And they had no idea how long they were going to be in captivity. And in the midst of all this, the Lord says to them, settle down, build houses. You're going to be here a while. 
For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you, give you hope in the future. And there's nothing wrong with using that scripture as a, as a plaque on your, on your wall, or, but you need to put it in context. It's not based on circumstances. It's not based on your environment. It's based on your attitude. God says, despite your sin, despite all that you've done against me, I am going to use this time of your life to be a blessing. So settle down, build houses. You're going to be here a while, for I know the plans are happy, you declares the Lord. So Ephesians chapter 5, let's read that again. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 to 21. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. Make the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and, and songs of the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. Always, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now in these seven verses, Paul gives us seven steps as to when it comes to what we need to do in order for our lives, our futures to be more effective and more on, on line with His will, in tune with His Spirit, and I mentioned last week that the first four that we looked at last week, uh, they deal with how we handle ourselves. And the last three that we'll talk about this morning is how we associate with people, people around us. Because really it all starts in here, doesn't it? You want to have a happy new year? It doesn't start with people. Well, I'll have a happy new year if my boss Martin's up, right? If my wife or my husband is a better person, treats me better. If my kids smarten up and do the right thing, oh, then I'll have a happy new year. Or if I finally sell the house or get the car I always wanted, or all these things that you put into place, say, this is what's going to make me happy. No, it starts in here, like we said. And so the first four we talked about last week start with us. We talked about be wise. Do not be unwise, but wise. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. Be careful. Don't just do sporadic things in your life and to expect whatever result that is, but really think things out before you make decisions, before even a word you say on your tongue. Is this wise, what I'm about to do? Or is it unwise? Or is it going to cause good consequences or, or negative consequences? Is it wise? We talked about that. Be effective. Making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. And we can all agree that we live in very evil times. And we can allow our evil times to affect us, or we can choose to affect our evil times with good. Amen? Times are evil just because people are evil and are doing evil things. So how do you conquer evil? How do you overcome evil? Do you conquer it with, by doing evil things back? Or do you conquer it by doing good things? Returning a curse with a blessing. Be effective. As I, as I said last week, as a church, we always need to evaluate ourselves as, as elders, leaders of the church and department, always evaluating ourselves, saying, are we being effective the way we do these things, the way we run our programs, the way we run our church? So are we being effective? Or is there a, an, an opportunity we have this year to tweak things, to not change the gospel? That'll never change. But the method, the, the concept of the way we bring it across is, is it, is, it, is it bringing the message home? Be effective. Make the most of every opportunity. Number three, be in God's will. Do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. As the Lord said Himself, Lord, Father, not my will, but Thy will be done. Everything we do, is it the Lord's will? will is he does he want you to do this does he want you to go there does he want you to say that does he want you to make that change or not make that change in your life be in god's will because he has a plan for you declares the lord and yes god gives us a free will he gives us choices to make i touched on this last week that god has desired will and determined will there are certain de wills that god has that are determined this is going to happen and nothing can change that one of them is the Lord's return. That is God's determined will. He will return. We can usher His return. We can do things to help guideline the timeline, but the truth is it's His will that He will return. But then there's also God's desire's will. 
where God gives us choices and says, listen, you choose. As I mentioned last Sunday, there was a time in my life where I was deciding between three different ministries. I knew God was making a change for my life and my family, and, and, God, and I was saying, God, which, one, which door do you want me to take? Which, which door do you want to open, Lord? And I'm praying, God, show it to me. And God said so clearly, and I'm so glad he did that. He says, you choose. You choose, and I'll bless it. And I chose what I felt was the Lord's will, and I was so blessed with that door. God gives us this the desired will, and so I pray that you would be wise in choosing God's will for your life. Don't just do things sporadically. We all can say this morning, I've made decisions at the spur of the moment, just like, oh, I got this need, boom, we respond. You look back going, what was I thinking? Why did I do that? Be in God's will. And of course, this went to the last one we talked about last week, be in tune with the Holy Spirit. Those two work together. If you want to be in God's will, you've got to be in tune with the Spirit. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. God wants you to be led by the Spirit. He will guide you into all truth. He'll show you things you need to do, say, things you need to change. He will show it to you, but you've got to be in tune with the Spirit. But if your mind's so filled up with stuff, the chaos, the chaos of life and just to allow your life to be filled up with all that stuff, you're not going to be able to hear the voice of the, the Lord through all the garbage. I mean, I'm talking about. A lot of Christians know more about what's happening in Hollywood than they know what's happening in the world. Right? And they're not in tune with the Spirit. They're not being led and being used by God. Be wise. Be discerning. Be in tune with the Spirit. And so 2024, if you want your 2024 to be a good year, it has to start with you. God wants to give you each a good year. Can you look back at this past year and say, it may not have been easy, but it was a good year. I know that I was right in the middle of God's will for my life. I can say that. Can you say that this morning? I know in some ways I could say, yeah, that probably wasn't God's will. It wasn't his best choice for me in that situation. We all can do that. And that's why it's so important to reflect, not just at the end of the year or the beginning of the year, but each and every day, take time out of the busyness of your schedule. Take the time. You see, even our prayer time, so many times we're so busy giving God our request and laying before him, our need, Lord, I need this, 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 and we just lay out our line. Okay, I've got to read some scripture, and we read the scripture. Okay, I've done my devotions for today, but you never gave the Lord one second or one opportunity to speak to you, reveal something to you. Take that moment where we're just reflecting on your walk with the Lord and say, yesterday, Lord, Lord, show me what I could have done differently at work yesterday in that situation, Lord. Show me. So I don't do that mistake again. Lord, help me with my kids right now. Show me what to say, what to do to help them in that scenario. I'm telling you right now, when you take the time to listen to the voice of the Lord, you're not going to make those mistakes because He's guiding you by His Holy Spirit. And you'll, at the end of the day, you'll be able to say, thank you, Lord, for helping me say that or not say that or do this or not do that. He will help you in that aspect. I promise you that. And so today we're going to continue on, and these, these next three that we're going to look at today, they deal with how we handle people, how we handle living a life around other people, because, you know, like, like I told you last week, the pastor said, I would love pastoring if it wasn't for people. And you might say, I, maybe, maybe you're a counselor, maybe you're, maybe you're some kind of business, and you'd say, I really enjoy my people, it wasn't for customers. Anybody feel that way? You know? We, have to do, we can't live on an island. No man's an island. We have to deal with each other. We, unless you want to get off the grid and live in the wilderness somewhere, but you're not going to be very effective for the Lord that way. The only way God wants to use us is to affect our world by touching other people's lives. And so we have to deal with people. We have to interact with sometimes very difficult people. And so today, let's look at these last three. Be an encourager, be thankful, and be submissive. Be an encourager, be thankful, and be submissive. Number five, be an encourager. Be an encourager. Verse 19, speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs of the Spirit. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. 
Now, I've mentioned this scripture before from this pulpit, but when Paul is, when Paul is saying, speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs of the Spirit, I don't think he literally means sing to each other, although you could try. Some of you might say, Pastor, trust me, you don't want me to sing to anybody. <laughs> it won't be very encouraging. <laughs> what is Paul trying to say when he says sing to... Was that a cultural thing that they were, they'd walk around like it was a musical and they're all singing to each other? What was Paul trying to bring across? He was saying, listen, when you speak, when you interact with people, may your words be like music. May your words be like beautiful music. I want to ask you this morning, if you want to New Year's to be a good year, where does encouragement start from? Where does it begin? It starts with us. I was talking to the guys at the breakfast yesterday morning, and, and uh, I was we were talking about some jobs we had and truck driving and stuff, and the one job I had where I dealt with truckers all the time, and and when I was managing make space storage at Deacon's Corner, and, and I gotta tell you, some drivers, some drivers were easier to talk to than others. Truck drivers here, you know what I'm talking about. Some truck drivers, they've just been alone far too many times. Just, they don't know how to interact with people, right? The, you know, they just, yeah. The communication skills are not up to par, you know? So they'd come in the office, they got their paperwork, and I'd say, good morning, then, good morning. And they'd throw the paper down at me, and. So I'm looking on the file, okay, is what container? Like we'd, they would drop off containers, sea cans. I'd say, how are you today? Fine. Right. Okay, well, have a great day. Here's a sign off. You can go to the back. I'll call back. They'll expect you. That was my job, just, just passing people through, guys to the back. And I'm telling you, these guys, some of these guys are just plain old mean. You know, they were mean. They looked mean. They looked scary, and they talked mean. And I tell you, I was too naive to be mean back at them. I was just kept on being nice at them. But I got to tell you, some of these drivers, probably by the fourth time of me saying "Good morning," how are you today? By the third, fourth time, they're saying "Good morning, Dan," and they actually would say, "How are you today?" Oh, I'm doing good. How was your weekend? Oh, I was not too bad. And they start sharing their stories. And it was amazing how after that full year of being there, I thank the Lord for allowing me to have that opportunity to be in that secular world for a little while, where, where I was able to speak life into these, these rough men. You see, it's so easy when you, you know, you're at the store or whatever and someone's rough at you, you just rough back. They get paid to be nice, they should be nice, and I'm thinking I'm going to tell them that. And the waitress, she's not getting a tip today because she, she forgot my second cup of coffee. And we tend to respond in a way that we feel is righteous because they're getting paid for that and they should behave better. God, church, listen. God has called us. We are called to be the encouragers. Amen? Not the world, but we are called. And we are living in a time right now it, it, where people are absolutely terrified. How many of you I'm talking about? People are terrified of the future. They're terrified of the world. They hear about wars and rumors of wars. And we can look at the scripture and say, hey, the Bible talks about it. But, you know, God wins in the end. And, and you know, it's going to be tough. But you know what? He'll get us through. We can have that mentality. But they don't have that mindset. And so they live in fear. They live in anxiety. They don't know what's going on. Surely the church needs to be the one that is the encourager to remind them that God loves them and they just have to trust him. Be an encourager. Be an encourager. Music starts with us. The music that he's talking about starts in here. He says, sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. I can tell you this morning, as long as I'm singing in my spirit, Constantly in the presence of the Lord, that's what's going to come out. Even when something negative comes at me, I will respond positively because it's already in my heart. But if you've got negativity in your heart, you've got a bad attitude, if someone's negative at you, guess what? You're going to be negative back. So it's our responsibility this new year. If you want to make it a good year, let it start within you that when you express to other people, you will only have your words are like music to them. Music is a powerful force. It has the power to stimulate and arouse an entire army to prepare for war, yet at the same time provide a calm and rest for the anxious soul. 
Anybody I get home from work from a, after a rough day and the first thing you want to do is put on some nice, quiet, relaxing music? Anybody ever do that? <sighs> and there's something about it. I remember as a teenager, I had all different types of music. Some was, <laughs> my, my daughter's boyfriend was over at the house the other night and we were talking about old music and I said, oh, let me pull out my old record collection. And I, in this one drawer I pull out, he, he never even seen a record before. Like he was just like this generation. Anyways, <laughs> I pull out this record collection. I'm going through them all, and this is, and I had I had this, you know, a lot of Christian music, but there was some that slipped in there that was still my still my secular stuff, right? But I remember playing some stuff, depending on my mood. How many can relate to that? You know, you know, as a teenager, you were just like in a bad mood. You come home from school, and and you. Turn on the rough stuff, you know. I'm like, blah, 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 blah. I don't think I shared this story, but one time I was playing a band called Foreigner, Foreigner, and and uh, and I had it cranked on ten. This is, and I'm just like, blah, 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 blah. you know, I'm not paying any attention to who's in the room. I thought it was by myself, and yeah, 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 you know, and all of a sudden I heard the music turned down behind me, right, and. And all of a sudden, the music goes right down, and here's my mom behind me going, and she's just praying, oh, Jesus, help my boy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, it was, it stir the, stir the soul. And music has a way of doing that. It can get you riled, or it can calm you down. The Bible's full of stories like that. First, first Samuel chapter 16, when King Saul was, he had that, that spirit within him, that evil spirit, and yet Dave, young David was filled with the Spirit of God, and, and he could come into that room, and he would start singing, and he'd start playing his, his instrument, his harp, and the Bible says that would calm the spirit of King Saul. Wow. Just by the voice of David, just by his music. Let me ask you this morning, are you like that? I'm not asking if you play a harp. <laughs> but I'm asking you this morning, when you come into a room, do you calm the spirit? in that place. Or when you come to work, the other guys are like, oh God, Bob's here, oh Lord. All right, pretend he's not here. Or do you calm the spirit in the room? You calm the spirit. I remember working for Teen Challenge and some guys would come into the room all flustered and they were, I gotta get out of here, I hate this place and I can't stand the other students and all that kind of stuff. Roger, you were never like that, but, but you know, I just, I gotta get out of here, this place is driving me nuts. And, and I would just be that calm boy, so now let's talk about this. Remember those conversations, Roger, right? Well, I tell you, that guy has an awesome mustache and I had to tell him one day to shave it off because Teen Challenge didn't allow mustaches at the time. Well, that was almost a breaking point, wasn't it, Roger? Right? And he was like, I'm not shaving my mustache off. For, I've had this since I was four. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice mustache, Roger. And I calmed him down and, and, hey, is it really worth leaving over a stash? Really? Is that what we're talking about? And he, he completed the program. You know what? We need to be that voice of reason, that voice of encouragement. You need to, you need to be that calming, calming song in people's lives. Ask yourself, am I known as a calm song or an irritating song? Am I someone that oh, just irritates people when I walk in the room? Or do they like, ah, oh, Bob's here, awesome. Ask yourself. David was like that. He had a calming spirit. He was able to calm the spirit of King Saul. In 2 Chronicles, when King Jehoshaphat, he, he was facing the enemies of the Ammonites and the Moabites and terrified by their enemy, but the Lord told them to appoint singers. Singers that would go ahead of them into battle. And the Bible says, as they were singing, they said, give thanks to the Lord for His love endures forever. Here they're going into battle and they're singing about God's love. That's not kind of ironic. They're about to experience death, destruction. They're terrified of their enemies, and they're singing a song about love. And the Lord said, I'm going to take care of your enemies, and they never even have to fight the battle. You see, you don't look at the certain situation and decide your music based on that, the, the, the music of your soul. 
You look at your circumstances. I'm going to sing about God's grace. I'm going to sing about God's love, His forgiveness, His, His pr- provision. That's what, that's what my spirit's going to sing in this situation. And as you're singing that, let me tell you, it'll calm your spirit. And not only your spirit, it'll calm those of those around you. That's the kind of 2024 God wants you to have, or you are going to be an encourager to others. You'll speak life and not death. You'll, you'll, you'll speak hope and not discouragement. That's what God wants you to sing. And so Paul is saying, speak to one another, to each other in psalms and hymns and songs of the Spirit. Sing and make music in your heart. Let that be the aroma of the room of God's Holy Spirit's presence. Psalm chapter 150, the last psalm, the entire chapter is about music. It says here, praise the Lord, praise, praise, praise the Lord, praise God in the sanctuary, praise Him in His in His in the mighty heavens, praise Him for His acts of of power, praise Him for His surpassing greatness, praise Him with the sounds of the trumpet, praise Him with the harp and with the lure, praise Him with the with the timbrel and the dancing, praise Him with the strings and pipes. Praise Him with the clash of cymbals. Praise Him with resounding cymbals. That sounds really loud. (laughs) Let everything that have breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Think he's trying to get a point across? He doesn't say praise Him when. He just says praise Him. And praise Him sometimes so loud that the enemy can't get through to your head. You're going to praise the Lord and the enemy can't even whisper in your ear because you're so, you're so loud in the Spirit just praising God. The enemy has no way of getting into your spirit. Praise Him. I encourage that even here on a Sunday. Praise Him. You might say, well, Pastor, I'm not that verbal. Never been that verbal. I, you know, I, I praise Him in here. Right there. <laughs> well, that's, that's good for you. But maybe someone else needs to see you praise the Lord. You know, when I, when I really gave my life to the Lord at the age of 16, and I'm not here to talk about any type, type of tradition or like that, all I'm saying is I was so desperate for God. I, I was just like, I need God. I, and I, I, I told him my story. I was on the verge of suicide. I was just, I was at wit's end with everything in life. My mom encouraged me to go to this church that she started to go to, and, and they, that's back in the days of evening services. And, and I remember walking to this church, and I was ta- telling Candace this story the other day. And, and I walked, the back, I sat right in the back, and I couldn't see the platform. Because that church was actually going through a revival at the time. It was going, it was moving, it was growing, it was, it was an exciting place. Wayne Parks was a pastor. I ended up working with him years later. And everyone in the church were like this, just raising their hands. And they were just calling on God all together. It was like a forest of hands. It was just like, <laughs> you know, you couldn't see the front. And, it, and I'm not here to say that was the end all. That everyone has to act like that. But there was such a passion in that service, such a hunger for God's presence. As a 16-year-old kid who just needed, I didn't just need to go to church because I went to church all my life. What I needed was to see people that had hope, that, had, that were living it in, in such a passionate way, exciting way. And I thought, I, I need this. I need this. And I, was, and I went to that church, and a year later, I, God touched my, my life and called me to ministry, and I, I never looked back. You see... Our, our, our praise, our singing of, 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 uh, to the Lord in our lives, it's not just for us to say, well, I'm in a mood to worship, therefore I'll worship. We are called to worship not just for ourselves, but for other people. David worshipped the Lord in front of King Saul, and he impacted King Saul's spirit. Now, King Saul grew jealous of him and threw a spear at him, but that's another story altogether. But there was something in his character that King Saul said, can you please come and sing to me? Sing a song. I just need comfort. And there's people in our world, there's people in our church, there's young people in this room even, who need to see the passion of Jesus in your life. 
They need to see the hunger for God's word in your life. They need to know that this is not something that happened 50 years ago, but it's happening every day where God's speaking to you and the Holy Spirit's revealing things to you. It's happening continuously. That's what they need to see. That's what I saw at 16. And I'm telling you, it changed my life because I believed it because what I saw in their lives. Amen? Mucus, mucus, music, <laughs> mucus. <laughs> music has been found to have powerful effects on the mental and physical health of patients in hospitals and hospices. Studies have shown that music can re reduce stress levels, improve moods, increase energy levels, and reduce pain levels, and even speed up recovery time for illness and injury. It's also been documented that even people with severe cases of dementia can suddenly muster the ability to sing entire lyrics of songs as soon as they begin to hear the music. Their brains turn on and they're able to sing everything. And as soon as the song is over, they go right back into that condition. Wow, that's how powerful music is, that you can stir up a dead brain to cause it to sing a song that they hadn't sung for years. There's something spiritual about music, church. And so when Paul says, sing to one another, he's not just saying, just sing a song. He's saying, may your life be a song. May people sense, when I'm with them, I get stirred up in my spirit. When I'm, in the, when I'm with them, I get encouraged. When I'm with them, I, I get inspired to, to, to keep going. To keep going. This past year of 2023, kind of music did your voice sing to others? What was your display, or your choice of music when it came to how you spoke to other people? I would encourage you, 2024, it's only just begun. Let's, let's make this a year of singing to each other, rejoicing. May our young people will look at you and say, man, I want to I know Jesus like you know Jesus. I want to be happy in the Spirit just like you're happy in the Spirit. Charles Swindoll wrote a story about a childhood memory about music. He says, I came from a musical family. My fondest memories are the memories of singing with the family that gathered around a piano with a brother who could play like crazy, a mother who sang soprano, and a sister who could handle a little alto. I would bring up the rear and whatever was left, and we would just sing through the evening. The Bloodworth family lived next door. They were very affluent. The parents often left their kids at home for a weekend as they had their fun, which ended tragically with the mother's suicide and the father's departure. The kids were left alone to raise themselves. At Christmas time one season, we were singing through the, the hours of the evening. As it got late, we decided we wouldn't bother the neighbors anymore, and we, we pulled the window shades down. Our phone rang in, in less than a minute, and it was the oldest of the four children who, who asked, would you please pull the window back up? We haven't heard singing like that, and we, well, we like to hear some more. I remember lifting the window up and looking out across the little area between our homes, and there they were, sitting like little ducks in the window, alone, with, alone that evening, finding music to soothe their hearts, that is the ministry of music. Nothing can duplicate it. I can honestly say that I think in my childhood it was similar to those kids. With dad's suicide and, and, and mom not working or not being home very often because she had to work just to keep the lights on, I can have those memories of just wanting some enjoyment. And I can think upon individuals in my life, and they had no idea how much joy they brought to me just by being them. And I remember one man I mentioned already, Wayne Parks, who I worked with years later. He was a short little man. He looked kind of Mexican. He had a little skinny mustache, and he was five foot five or whatever he was, five foot four. And, and all the time, he, his, I got to be friends with his son, David, and they always invited me over for supper. And to play video games. I think it was Atari back then. And I just remember wanting to be in that home. I'd, I'd, I'd go down their basement, and it was 
you know, dark paneling back then and, you know, deep shade carpet. And it was the 80s. It was the early 80s. But I just felt such a warmth in that home. I just wanted to stay there. I just watched him and how his sons interacted with their, their dad. And, and I admired that. I thought, man, what a neat thing to have as a dad that jokes around with you and laughs with you. And, and I'm looking at that going, I don't, I don't understand what that is. I never had that. I thought, one day when I'm a dad, that's what I want to be to my kids. They welcomed me in. They, I became part of the family. And then years later, years after Bible school, he finally called me up and said, can you come work with me? And I said, absolutely. And we had a wonderful seven years together. I'm saying that to say that, to say this, is that you never know how you'll impact people. People in their, in, their, in their lives who are just so lonely right now and so desperate. It doesn't take much to invite them over for dinner or pay them a visit or just to simply giving them a word of encouragement in the grocery store. You never know, you never know what your words will say, what your words will do. They'll remember it like I remember those times 40 years later. I still remember, I still remember those moments. We all need to be those people. We all need to be singing. We all need to be encouraging to others. James chapter 3, verse 9 and 10 says this. He says, with, with your tongue we praise the Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. We cannot be saying we're praising God on Sunday and yet cursing our brother on Monday. Because the ones that won't believe it the most are our own family, our own kids. Those who don't know the Lord will not believe a word you say. They don't care about the scripture you know. won't care about the memorization. They don't care about your theology, but they, do, they will know if you care for them. And that's all that matters. That's when you can present the gospel. You see, Jesus didn't preach a lot of things differently than the Pharisees. We sang about the Pharisees in that very, very deep song this morning. He didn't preach much different than the Pharisees, but he preached it by living it. Do you understand? A lot of the teachings that he gave, the Pharisees gave the same teachings. Love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. But they didn't live it. Jesus lived it, and the Bible said he spoke as one with authority. He spoke as one who actually believed what he learned. And we need to live what we're saying, what we believe, what we're singing on Sunday morning. I pray we're singing it all day long by our, by our behavior. So be an encourager. Number six, be thankful. Always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And you might be thinking back in 2023 and say, well, Pastor Dan, I was thankful. I was thankful for my family. I was thankful for my job. I was thankful for my health. I, I had so many things to be thankful for. And I'm saying that's wonderful. Even the world can say thank you for all those same things. And we need to be thankful for all those things. Many times we take them for granted. But notice what he says here. There's two very important words, and those words are always and everything. Always give thanks to God the Father for what? Everything. Everything? Everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is what sets us apart from the world. The world can look back and say, well, I had a good year because 2023, I was thankful for this. So yeah, a lot of good things that happened. But we can, even when everything seemed to go against us, we can still say 2023 was a good year because this was difficult, but this led to this, this led to this. And you can't, may not see it immediately. It might, you may not even see it in this, in this lifetime, but you can know that God is still working all things together for good for those who love God and are called according to His purpose. You can say it was a good year because God was working through it all. Be thankful. 
We know the scripture, Philippians chapter 4, verse 12 to 13. I know what it is to be in need. And I know what it is to, to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through Him who gives me strength. Now Paul says here he's learned the secret. The secret of being content. You might say, what's the secret to happiness? What's the secret to be able to rejoice like that in every situation? The secret is this. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do it. I can, that's the secret. It's not very deep, is it? But it's true. I can, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Because Romans 8.28 says, All things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. All things God works for good. But not for everybody. If you're going to go rob a bank in 2024 and you get, you know, arrested and put in prison, you're not going to sit in prison going, well, God, I don't know how you're going to work this out for good, but I trust you. You know? God's going, well, you shouldn't have robbed the bank in the first place. God works all things together for good for those who love Him who have been called according to His purpose. If that is you today, if you love the Lord and you're called according to His purpose and you're serving Him, no matter what comes your way in 2024, you know that it's all going to work together for His good. Amen? I went through some painful situations in 2023. But I thank God for them. I would not be standing here if it wasn't for them. And I said already, and I'll say it again, I really like being here. I love this church. My wife and I feel so accepted and so loved. You see, God had to close doors in order to open other doors. So thank the Lord for closed doors. Maybe some doors are going to slam closed in 2024 for you. Don't be shaking that door and say, open up, open up. God's going, I... I let go of the door because <laughs> this one over here is opening up for you. But I like this door. I know it's a nice door. It's a, but look at this one. Wow, look what's in there. God wants that for you. But if all our focus is on that door, God's going, listen, you're missing out the blessing because you've got to let go of that one to receive this one. So rejoice when things happen, when doors close, where things don't happen the way they thought they would. The truth is, things happen. Stuff happens. I've got to use another term, but I won't. <laughs> but all things work together for good for those who love God and according to His purpose. And your life it can always be worse off. Like my, my wife's grandmother always said, suppose others got it worse. She always said that. Suppose others got it worse. I love this cartoon that I, maybe you've seen this before. It says, number one, guy's looking at the brand new car. Look at that new car. He's so envious for the car. Like, oh, I wish I had that car, not a rusty one like mine. And, and you got the guy on the bike going, oh, if I only could afford a car. Oh, yeah. number three is, I wish I had a bike. The guy's looking at the guy on a bike and he's like, oh, I wish he had that bike. And the guy in wheelchairs looking at the guy walking. He says, he can go anywhere he wants. See, it's all a matter of perspective, isn't it? You can look back at 2023 and say, well, I didn't have this, I don't have that. And thank the Lord for everything we do have. I'm kind of grateful for some of the things I went through as a child. Because when, you know, when you're going through it, you don't really... If you grew up poor, you don't know you're poor. I mean, you know what you're talking about. You know, when you don't have anything, and I, I, I grew up, fruit, the fridge was always empty. I, it was just one of these things. And I, after school, maybe you did this too, but my after school treat was, wasn't uh, chips or anything like that. My after school treat was the cold porridge that's still sitting on the stove from what's left over from this morning. Who grew up with that? Anybody? Oh, cold porridge, right on. And I put a little milk on there and white sugar and 
That was my treat after school, was cold porridge. Because there's nothing else to eat. And you know you're poor, because you don't have what your friends have, but you don't really know it's that bad. And then when you're out of that, and you start your own family, and, and you realize, did I really live like that? So I, I'm just so grateful. Like In my prayer time, it's always part of my prayer time. Lord, I thank you for my, my, the food I eat. I thank you for my, my house. I thank you for my loving family. I, there's so many things I'm th- so thankful for because I didn't have it growing up. And so you need to be, you need to be thankful for the hard times because you don't appreciate the good times. That's why Paul said, I learned the secret of being content in every in any situation, whether hungry or well fed. He says, it's, you know, I've learned to content because I, you, you, you learn to appreciate so much when you don't have it, and you appreciate what you have so much more when you didn't have it before. It's a learning process. Paul says, I learned the secret. It's a lesson. And yes, some people are much more positive people than others. We've all met positive people, and you know, and and and, you know, my my wife and I are are very different people. And I realize a lot of it has to do with our upbringing. She came in a very very strong family, very loving family. I've shared before. She talks to her parents every day, most times twice a day, right? This day will not end without Lenise talking to her parents. And that's not a dig. It's a beautiful thing. It's a wonderful thing. I admire it. And it it affected her life so much. She understands connectedness. She understands stability. And she understands love and support. She gets it. And she grew up with that environment. She's been wired that way because all her life, that's what she had. Those of us who haven't had that, it's more difficult to appreciate that. It's more difficult to understand that. But it is possible, as the Apostle Paul said, I've learned the secret. It doesn't come naturally. Positivity comes natural to more to some people because of their upbringing. Other people who had a lot of negative, it, it's a learning process to be positive. And I'm much more of a positive person today than I was growing up. And it's a lot by the people that have been around me, including my, my wife be appreciative, to be thankful, learning the secret to be content in every situation. Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord. I close off the last one this morning, that is be submissive. Verse 21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Let me tell you something that I've learned over the years, a revelation of Christ, an experience of God where you learn to to, to, to have, have the real reverence of God never leads you to pride. When you have a revelation of God, when you understand who He is, when you understand what He's done for you on the cross, you don't become a pride person through that revelation. You always become a humble, submissive person. Amen? When you look at the Christmas story, how He came into this world as a babe in a manger, that causes you to realize, I need to be humble as Christ. When you realize He went to the cross, all the way to the cross, even death on a cross, as Philippians talks about, humbling himself to death, even death on a cross. When you realize what he's done for you, it, you will be a humble and submissive person. And if you find yourself being prideful and think you're better than other people and arrogant, let me tell you, you need to get back to the cross. You need to have a new revelation of Jesus because you cannot walk away from the cross. You cannot walk away from that experience and be prideful. You remain humble saying, thank you, Jesus. You went to lowest of lows, Lord. You went to the thief on the cross, said, today you'll be with me in paradise. A man who absolutely did nothing to prove his love for you, but yet you saved him just by confessing you. Lord, may I serve in such a way, not what people can give to me or what they do for me, but I will just serve. I will humble myself. I will be a servant to others as you were a servant. And I tell you this year, 2024, if you learn to be submissive and begin to love and speak life and speak hope and music in your heart to other people, people will take notice of you. People will honor you. People will respect you. Oh, yes, you'll always have those who hate you. There will always be persecution. But for those who are looking for hope, you will be that beacon that they're so desperately looking for. 
So in closing this morning, be wise. Be effective. Be in God's will. Be in tune with the Holy Spirit. Be an encourager. Be thankful. And be submissive. All those seem like really high, high callings. And like, how am I going to do all that, Pastor? That's a lot of homework. <laughs> I am telling you right now, just let the Holy Spirit lead you. Every day, reflect on, him, on His presence and say, Lord, use me today. I am telling you, these will become natural aspects. Just like the fruits of the Spirit we talked about a few weeks ago. These will become natural outflow of who you are the more time you spend with Jesus. Amen? Amen. Let's pray today. Father, thank you that you've set the example for us. Thank you, Lord God, for your goodness to us and your mercies that are new every morning that we, so many times, we fall short. We fall short and we don't make wise decisions because of that we're not very effective and we fall out of your will and we're not led by the Holy Spirit and definitely don't encourage people and we're so unthankful and, and God, we become prideful. God, help us, Lord, to to learn the secret of being content in any and every situation. Learn the secret, Lord, to hear your voice, O oh God, to be led by your Spirit, be tuned with your Spirit. 2024 will be a happy new year when we put these things into practice. Help us, Lord. Help us get our eyes off the world and on you every single day, we pray. Amen.